The Secrets of Dumbledore has finally been released, and the finale of the film has a lot to unpack. In this video, I'm going to break down and explain the ending of Fantastic Beasts 3. I'll be going over what Bunty said, what happened with Dumbledore and the Chillin, Dumbledore and Grindelwald's fight and how that took place, what happened to the Blood Pact, Aberforth and Credence's interaction, the duel between Aberforth, Albus, and Grindelwald, and the final scene in New York. Now obviously, there are going to be spoilers, but I'm assuming if you clicked on this video, you've either seen the movie or don't care about spoilers, so let's get into it. The final scene takes place at the Kingdom of Bhutan, where the election for the leader of the International Confederation of Wizards was happening. Credence and Newt called Grindelwald out for influencing the Chillin, who just chose Grindelwald to be the leader. As Newt was speaking, Bunty brought him a suitcase. She had been hiding among the ranks of those in the Kingdom of Bhutan. She looked at Newt and said, No one can know everything, Newt, not even you, which was the line she said to him on the train earlier in the film. As we know, Dumbledore had Newt give her a piece of paper, which he was told only Bunty could read, and after she read it, it vanished. We now know what that note said. It said to keep Newt in the dark about Dumbledore's plan with this case, something Bunty clearly felt badly about, but ultimately, this plan worked to perfection. After it was revealed that the Chillin had been tampered with by Grindelwald, and it really was dead, the twin of the dead Chillin bowed down to Dumbledore. As explained earlier in the film, if this creature that can see into your soul bows down to you, it means you are pure of heart, and it was choosing Dumbledore to take on the leading role for the International Confederation of Wizards. Dumbledore's reaction was him saying, no, 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 please no, as he backed away from the creature. The reason he reacted this way is because Dumbledore swore to himself that he would never take on a position of power. He had seen he was easily corrupted by power the summer he met Grindelwald. In the Deathly Hallows, he said to Harry, I had proven as a very young man that power was my weakness and my temptation. Because of this, Dumbledore declines this role and Santos is chosen instead. After that, Credence steps forward and Grindelwald shoots a green spell at him, which of course means the Killing Curse. However, both Albus and Aberforth Dumbledore protect their son and nephew, and their three spells intertwine as they duel. This moment is huge because this scene perfectly parallels the duel they had all those years ago as kids. It was the Dumbledore brothers against Grindelwald, and at the center of it all was an obscurial from the Dumbledore family. All those years ago, it was their sister Ariana, but this time, Credence takes her place. Unlike last time though, the brothers save a life rather than take one, as Credence lived while Ariana died. Now this is where it gets complicated. We all know that the blood pack kept Gellard and Albus from being able to fight one another, but there was a loophole. Because Grindelwald sought to kill and Dumbledore sought to protect, their spells were able to meet and the blood pack set them free. It took them into this weird dimension where no one could see them. The two dueled it out, and when people saw this in the trailer, they were confused. In the original series, we were told that the two of them did not fight each other until 1945 when Dumbledore defeated Grindelwald, which is still 10 to 15 years away. But now seeing the movie, we can understand why the Wizarding World thought that was their first duel. It was because nobody saw them fight here in this alternate dimension the Blood Pact put them in. The two fought each other until they both realized their hand was on the other's heart. This made them lower their wands, and Dumbledore began to walk away. As he did, Grindelwald asked him, Who will love you now, Dumbledore? And Dumbledore responded saying, I'm all alone. The Blood Pack then hit the ground and broke open, which took the two of them out of this weird dimension the Blood Pact had put them in. We then see that during this duel, time stood still for everybody else. When we leave, Santos is celebrated for winning the election, and everybody approached Grindelwald as he said he was not their enemy. He then looked right at Dumbledore and said, then or now. Breaking this down, he's saying he was not his enemy when they were kids who had fallen in love, and he does not want to be his enemy now. He wants Dumbledore to join his side, as we saw in the opening scene, and continue the plans that they had started as teenagers to rule over the Wizarding World and rule over the Muggles. This shows that Grindelwald still cares about Dumbledore, and he's sad and feels abandoned by Albus, which we find out in this movie is what he told Credence earlier, he said that they were both abandoned by Albus. This also shows a different view to the situation, and we see that what Grindelwald is doing, he thinks is the right thing to do. And after that, he fell backward and disapparated to escape. Now this next moment was a jaw-dropping moment for me, as we see Aberforth comforting his son Credence. When Credence asked his father if he ever thought about him, Aberforth responded saying, Always. The famous line that Snape said during the prince's tale about Lily, After all this time, always and the line that Lily said to her son Harry in the Deathly Hallows Part 2 film. Stay close to me. Always. 
Aberforth told Credence to come home, which Credence had asked him for earlier in the movie through the mirror. The two then leave together, and they're followed by the phoenix. The phoenix is important here, because earlier, Albus had stated that the bird followed Credence because he was dying. Between knowing that and seeing that Credence could barely walk, it looks like because of the Obscurus inside of Credence, he does not have much time left, but he can rest easily as he's finally beside his true family that he was trying to find for so long. After that, Newt and Bunty talk, and Newt talks about being reunited with his suitcase and the chillin', saying it takes losing something to realize how much it means, and as he said this, it cuts to a shot of his picture of Tina, which adds a second meaning to the line he just uttered. It was about losing and getting back both the chillin' and Tina. Dumbledore and Newt then discuss the blood pact breaking, and Dumbledore tells him what I told you earlier. Because Grindelwald sought to kill and he sought to protect, they were able to fight each other, and Dumbledore leaves Newt on this topic saying they would call it fate. Now the protection part is interesting, because we all know about the power of the love protection. It's what saved Harry from Voldemort as a baby. Lily sacrificed her life to protect Harry, which in turn put a protection on him. So when Voldemort went to kill him, the killing curse rebounded and hit him instead. I do not think that's what happened here though, I don't think Albus and Aberforth doing that put a protection on Credence. I think this because nobody died to protect Credence as Lily died to protect Harry. Without someone sacrificing their life, I don't think that the love protection will work. However, Credence being a Dumbledore might have had something to do with the blood pact breaking, because Grindelwald went after a member of Albus's family, which might have broken some rule in the blood pact the two shared. However, we also have to take into consideration when the blood pact was made, because he also went after Aberforth when they were kids, which of course led to the big duel. Did they make the blood pact before that duel or after? If it was before, then everything I just said about Credence being a Dumbledore breaking the blood pact doesn't really work, but if it was after, it does. Anyway, moving on, Dumbledore promises Theseus that he would find and stop Grindelwald, but as we know, it would take him 10 to 15 years to do so, which might lead to some tension between Dumbledore and Theseus later on in the later films. The final scene takes place at Jacob's Bakery, and we arrive at his and Queenie's wedding night. Newt is reunited with Tina, and the two have a very awkward but endearing moment, which sort of defines their relationship. Newt then notices Dumbledore across the street, and he goes over to speak with him. Dumbledore thanks Newt for everything, saying he could not have done it without him. Newt smiles, then begins to walk away, but he turns back and says that he was willing to do it again if Dumbledore needed him. The movie ends as Dumbledore watches everyone happy and together while he's all alone, which goes back to what he and Grindelwald said after their duel. Who will love you now, Dumbledore? Which Dumbledore replied to saying, I'm all alone. And that's exactly where we leave him, all alone. The blood pact was his bond with the man he loved, but now that it was destroyed, he no longer had that emotional tie to Grindelwald. Dumbledore then walks away through the streets of New York. And there it is, the ending to this movie completely unpacked and explained. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life like my cute dog Loki and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe and look out for more great movie flame videos on the way.